This is the heart of the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. Since the early years of World War II, this building has been the home of America's Department of Defense. It's one of the largest office buildings in the world. About 23,000 people come here to work every day. A good many of them are not even members of our armed forces. Many are civilian employees from all walks of life. All of them, though, are mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters. The men and women who travel these halls every day come here for one purpose only, to help defend our nation and the cause of freedom around the world. It's been that way for nearly 70 years. The story you're about to hear today is a story I hope will reach every American, because it's really a story about America, about ordinary American families, about how we face the perils, uncertainties, and tragedies of life, and about how we, as individuals and a nation, come together to heal the wounds of those who have made the ultimate sacrifice for all that we hold dear. It's a story of reflection, remembrance, and renewal. It's also a story about hope for the future. And I, I remember, you know, some days my wife would be sitting here, and just the fact that her presence, that's all I wanted was just her presence. We didn't have to say anything. The fact that I knew that she was there and I was over here, that's, that's all I cared about. Nothing else. I knew that she was here. The other two came home and I made sure they got some good food, you know, stuffed them as much as I could with anything they'd eat, figuring, and they wouldn't be eating a lot for a while. And um, then told them, and yeah, I will never forget that day, especially my youngest. Um, Brady just looked dazed. But you could just see Kelsey change. It's like the light in her eyes just left. And uh, I've never heard a child cry like that before. It was, I think it was the worst day of my life. And I'm hoping that, that they will use our the way Jan, um, Jan lived, as a model to bring up that children. On a plot of land in Arlington, Virginia, overlooking our nation's capital, the grass is growing again. Trees have been planted that bloom in newness of life each spring. The wall has been rebuilt. As if in silent honor, for the briefest of moments each evening, the setting sun itself pays tribute with a golden light pouring forth on what is now hallowed ground for all of America. We wanted some way to ensure that all of the victims murdered that day, they were never forgotten. In the night sky, the radiance of 184 illuminations of remembrance shimmer in the darkness in honor of 184 men, women, and children whose lives were extinguished in an instant on a hauntingly beautiful fall morning. The last six, seven years have been absolutely surreal. In one minute, it seems like it was in another lifetime when Michelle was here. In another minute, it seems like it was just 30 seconds ago. Seven years later, thousands of Americans come together to join hands with the wives, the husbands, the children and the grandchildren, the parents and the grandparents of the 184 who perished that day. 
For on this day, from the ashes of death and destruction, a living memorial has arisen to not only mark one of the most tragic events in all of American history, but to stand eternally in honor and remembrance of those who paid so dear a price for our freedom and their courageous families who carry on their legacy. This is the Pentagon Memorial, America's first national memorial to those who died on September 11, 2001. While it stands in remembrance of all those who lost their lives that tragic morning, it also stands in living testament to their families, who year after year are bravely and quietly piecing their lives back together. This then is their story. And while it is a story of painful remembrance and unresolved suffering, it is also a story of renewal and perseverance and hope in the greatest tradition of the American spirit. There are over 160 monuments and memorials in our nation's capital, dating back to the founding of America. Some honor a select few men and women who shaped our country and helped define who we are as a nation today. Generals, political leaders, poets, statesmen, and scientists who changed the course of American history. Some raise the hopes and aspiration of a nation unique in all the world. Others set forth the values and ideals on which our republic was based and to which we would aspire for generations to come. Still others honor ordinary Americans who through their courage, dedication and commitment made extraordinary contributions to America and the cause of freedom around the world. Many left their families and the comfort and security of home to unselfishly answer the call when their nation needed them most and fought and died for all that we hold dear today. Virtually all span the great history of America, commemorating events and individuals of our distant past. One, however, is unique among all the rest for it represents the defining moment for this generation of Americans. Years from now, I hope they understand that, you know, you know, what happened on that terrible day. That an enemy came uh, with airplanes full of innocent people to kill Americans in order for us to abandon our great desire to help others realize the blessings of liberty. Hosted a breakfast, I believe, at 7 or 8, 7.30 or 8, and uh, for members of Congress, Republican and Democrat. And I can remember saying to them at this breakfast, uh, probably just about the time the first plane hit the World Trade Center tower, that something was going to happen in America uh, in 6 months, 12 months, 18 months, nobody knows when. That, that will register in a way that they will want to have supported sufficient defense investment in our country. 
The morning of September 11th, the darkest day in American history, came in like a lamb and went out like a lion. It was a warm, sunny morning in Washington, D.C., just as it was in New York City and all along the eastern seaboard, typical of that time of year when the dog days of August give way to a hint of the cool, crisp air that comes to rest on the city every fall. Most who were there remember, above all, the clear blue sky. Almost prophetically, the deep, cloudless blue had an undefinable radiance that many years later remains a hauntingly vivid memory to those who lived through September 11th. It was quite simply a regular Tuesday morning, just like any other, filled with morning rituals like every other Tuesday, getting kids off to school, driving to work in the often grueling traffic of Washington, D.C., hopping on the metro and hoping to beat the morning rush. For some, the morning was filled with expectancy as they drove to the airport to embark on a long-awaited vacation. Young Asia Colton, Rodney Dickens, and Bernard Brown were brimming with excitement as they had been selected from a group of sixth graders to fly all the way to California with their teachers for a National Geographic conference. The day was just a normal day, and Bill went off to work, I got the kids to school, and she, uh, I worked part-time. banished me from driving because uh, she claimed that uh, my driving, I was reckless. So she drove that morning and uh, uh, we chit chat. He went on, we said, yeah, we were gonna meet at the mall for dinner, you know, so. Marjorie Salamone worked late the night before and was tired as she kissed her husband, Ben, goodbye and left for work that Tuesday morning. And I noticed that her dress was open in the back. And, you know, so I looked at that and I just thought, gee, I wonder if she knows that her dress is open in the back. So I said something to her about it, and she said, oh yeah, I know about it. And I said, okay. Uh, and I think that might have been the last thing we said. I, I just don't remember. Nobody knew what lay ahead. They turned off a transponder radio beacon, dove the airplane down, uh, got it below radar contact. A lot of hijack codes in the system and we're gonna land all the aircraft. Yeah, the screen. You never see if the first plane hit the first tower. Hit the second tower. And then they said, I'm not stopping. She said it was 577. And then I grabbed her and I said, Eddie was on 577. When anyone in the building felt the impact, it was so powerful. I look in the sky. And I remember that smoke. You see the Pentagon, quite terribly, and you see black smoke rising up. Just awful. And I said, uh, my, my wife works there, and I, and I had and it heard from her. I got off the office where I was going to start calling people. Have you heard from anybody? Have you heard from anybody? And then my next plan was to check the voicemail, and there was about 30 uh, messages on the voicemail, and I started going down, and I was hoping that Jan had called, and then when I got down to three, um, my hope started dwindling. As long as the United States of America is determined and strong, this will not be an age of terror. This will be an age of liberty here and across the world. Americans awoke on September 12, 2001 with the realization that our nation was changed forever. We were living in a new world, with history broken into the pre-9-11 era and the post-9-11 era. There probably wasn't any other event that, that made us understand as a nation that we're all linked in so many different ways. Um, that, that we all play a role in our security, in our well-being, in the well-being of the Republic. Well, 9-11 uh, drove home the point that uh, we are part of a world and can't uh, separate ourselves from it by our oceans, that uh, 
Uh, we have to be engaged in the world, hopefully smartly, not just militarily, although we must be strong, but also we must be wise, we must uh, engage with others. Well, on 9-11-01, America changed. Uh, obviously, we, we lost about 3,000 of our fellow Americans, but we also, in some sense, lost our innocence. I think what changed on September 11th for so many Americans was the fact that, that it was brought home and, and we realized the vulnerability that we, we uh, face. The, the purpose of terror, I, terror, of course, is not to necessarily kill people, although that's part of it. Uh, it's to terrorize. The purpose of terrorism is to alter people's behavior. And therefore, the, the most vulnerable people in the world are free people. We recognized with absolute clarity that there is an enemy that uh, has a set of beliefs that would like to do us harm to achieve their objectives. I think the nation became more compassionate on that day. The nation became more united on that day. And the nation became more determined on that day. It all happened here, the point of impact. On September 11, 2001, a direct attack on American soil signaled the birth of an entirely new world. What followed was a surge in patriotism not seen since Pearl Harbor, with flags on every street corner and signs posted almost everywhere that proclaimed, God bless America. Enormous benefit concerts took place on both coasts, and America was left with a new kind of 21st century hero, the first responder. For a time, our deeply divided country was one again. After 9-11, after we resolved that we would defend ourselves, came this great wave of patriotism where there's a great sense of pride about what we stood for. I'll never forget going to New York and seeing that uh, on the one hand, compassion for their fellow citizens and for the families that were suffering. On the other hand, this great sense of resolve and determination uh, to, to stand in, uh, strong in the face of this, uh, of this enemy. A sense of coming together, I guess, uh, I think is, a, is the best way to describe it. Um, it was a sentiment that extended across party lines in the Congress, uh, House and Senate, Democrat and Republican pulled together. Millions of people visited those sites in, in succeeding months, uh, focused on them in one way or another, uh, focused on those events. And it was a, a national experience to some extent like Pearl Harbor, uh, that it had that kind of uh, unifying effect on the nation. The tragedy of 9-11 uh, pulled America together uh, and showed us what we really should appreciate every day as we squabble politically or there are other divisions in our country that we're all part of the American family. We share common values, we share common dreams for ourselves, our families, and our country. The terrorists who attacked us on 9-11 didn't distinguish between Republicans or Democrats or white or black or uh, Christian, Jewish, Muslim. The, the, their victims were all of those and more. We will lose our strength unless we uh, recapture our uh, fundamental unity as Americans. There's nothing more important than that. But 9-11 sort of brought that out in us. Gee, we're all in this together. This hurt all of us. This hurt Wall Street. This hurt our military. Um, this hurt us as a nation. It hurt us, uh, our international friends who were here with us. Uh, had all these different impacts of all sorts. I think our resolve was stronger right after 9-11 than probably ever before. Although we were uncertain, uh, some were afraid. Uh, some people never ride airplanes anymore. Some people, they took five or six years for some businesses to recover from the impact of 9-11, but the resolve was always pretty clear, and I think that was felt throughout the majority of our population. Facing the reality of what happened, and then feeling the strength of the country, and the uh, how together we were, 
I mean, that's a powerful feeling for the, those in, in positions of responsibility. That is a gift to receive that from your country. Shortly after the attacks, the Pentagon renovation team set forth on an ambitious plan to rebuild the Pentagon in one year. A dramatic symbol of our national resolve and a visible reminder that America could not be defeated. But in time, our old divisions took hold again and many of the flags were put away. As a nation, we moved back into our own lives. Lives somehow changed by 9-11 but no longer defined by the tragedy and our national response to it. But not everybody was able to move on. For some, the tragedy of September 11th is as real today as it was then. know why just for me moving on denotes leaving Bob behind I'm moving on I'm going someplace without him uh, I prefer the term moving forward because it doesn't to me have the same um, feel or sound of leaving my husband behind for us there is no happy ending there is no ending it's just 9-11 is this I don't even know how to describe it. It is part of you. If you don't learn to manage it, you're not gonna do well. It never goes away. There will never be a day that I don't think about it. I don't think about Bill. There will never be a 9-11 that I can walk through my day and go, wow, you know, 20 years ago today, you know, my husband died. You realize it's just a part of your life and that's just the way it is. Of those who perished at the Pentagon on 9-11, only 55 were members of the military. 70 others were civilians working at or visiting the Pentagon, and 59 were killed while flying on American Airlines Flight 77. For the families of the 184 men, women, and children lost at the Pentagon, their lives and the lives of their children can never go back to normal. As Americans, we tend to like our stories neatly packaged, with a clear beginning, middle, and of course a happy ending. The tragedy of 9-11 doesn't fit into our notions of what makes a good story. There will never be the modern idea of closure. For some, 9-11 is and will remain very much unresolved. But with this lack of resolution, life goes on. As one Pentagon family member put it, life is for the living. And in the wake of 9-11, through the completion of the Pentagon Memorial, signs of life can be found everywhere. At its core, the Pentagon Memorial is a story of how a nation takes care of its own. I felt a need to to de dedicate my energies towards something positive, towards something that, um, that I think could alleviate the pain from everyone, including myself. And uh, I just happened to um, see an ad in the paper. It wasn't an ad, but more of a sort of this, this idea of a memorial. And there was a name in the article, and I, I emailed um, the person and asked if I could be a part of this in some small way. I think it was not long after his funeral, and um, I remembered sort of feeling like, wow, you know, if, if there's a if there's a possibility to participate in something positive out of all the terrible things that are going on and all the bad feelings, I 
I remember saying, gee, you know, this, this might be something to try to uh, contribute in a tiny way. You know, I want people to remember Dave. I want people to know what he was about. I want people to, um, you know, re remember him as a person. And, and I want to have a place to go to that I can think about this. Building a memorial here at the Pentagon uh, in honor of those victims, uh, in, uh, in remembrance of the events of September 11th, and of the significance of all that for the Pentagon for this Department of Defense headquarters uh, gives this 9-11 uh, memorial a very special character. In the weeks following 9-11, the nation wrapped its arms around the families of the victims. As one family member put it, among the most amazing things that came out of that terrible tragedy was Americans coming together strangers comforting each other, risking their lives for each other. Meg Falk was the director of the Office of Family Policy at the time and was working in the Pentagon when the plane hit on 9-11. In the days and weeks that followed, she played a central role in reaching out to the families in turmoil. This is a tradition within the military, is that whenever we have multiple fatalities, we set up a place where families can go to get accurate information, to get support, to have childcare, so that the, the, the surviving family members can deal with the business they need to handle at a horrible time in their lives. By the next morning, the Family Assistance Center was up and running at a nearby hotel. For the next 30 days, the Pentagon operated the center around the clock, providing families with meals, support, and most importantly, information. It was wonderful. I mean, if, if we asked for something, it was, it was made available to us. Calling cards, how many times did we get calling cards? They must have loaded us up with calling cards. Uh, you know, they, they, they just didn't know what else to do for us. The American people were just extremely kind to us. Extremely kind to us. It was during the course of those daily family briefings that an idea began to circulate to build something good on top of the evil they had experienced, to lay down the foundations for a memorial that would reach long into the future and serve as both a legacy for the living and a means of preserving the stories of 9-11 and the memory of those who died. And at the end of every briefing, uh, there's a chance for people to ask questions. And uh, a predominant question that first week, because we, I started going the 15th of September, um, was how are we going to remember this? They started talking about memorializing this. And I started thinking to myself, you know, what if five years from now someone's driving by the Pentagon and they can't even remember what side was hit? The very process of coming together proved to be a source of healing for the families as they struggled to make sense of their new worlds in the aftermath of the horrible tragedy. As the family members began to come forward one by one to support the project, the official call was put forth for designs for the new Pentagon Memorial. On June 28, 2002, the group released a mission statement calling upon the country to help determine how to best remember that day and the men, women, and children lost at the Pentagon. We ask that you search your souls and envision a memorial that inspires visitors to contemplate what the attack means to them personally, to us as family members, to the community, to the country, and to the world. Visitors should comprehend that our loved ones were murdered simply because they were living and working in and enjoying the benefits of a free society. The memorial should instill the ideas that patriotism is a moral duty, that freedom comes at a price, and that the victims of this attack have paid the ultimate price. We challenge you, the statement concluded, to create a memorial that translates this terrible tragedy into a place of solace, peace, and healing.
It's been said that the character of a nation is forged not in tragedy, but in its response to tragedy. As such, the story of the Pentagon Memorial is a story of hope and inspiration. It is part of the healing both for the nation and for the families of the 184 men, women, and children lost here that day. The memorial represents a nation that, while never forgetting, maintains a conviction to build hope where once there was only despair, peace where once there was only conflict, and a future where once we saw only an ending. It's an individual memorial, it's a collective memorial, and in a very eloquent way, it kind of tells a story about what happened there. Um, you know, the family members, when we talked about this, we said we wanted a, a place that would make people think, but not tell them what to think. We were looking for a deeper meaning. We liked the feeling of going to a place and experiencing it in our own way. By September 2002, more than 1,100 designs were submitted from around the world for the Pentagon Memorial. After much review, in February 2003, the jury panel settled on a design by Keith Caseman and Julie Beckman, two young architects from Philadelphia. In time, the design would become America's first national 9-11 memorial, built on the very site of the crash of American Airlines Flight 77. Support for the memorial came forth from the entire country. Major American corporations joined hands with key international partners and individual American donors, some of whom gave even a small contribution from savings to see that the attack on the Pentagon was never forgotten. At a foundry outside St. Louis, Missouri, custom molds and metal alloys were created that would form the 184 individual benches on display throughout the memorial. Steel fired at over 3,000 degrees would ultimately be crafted into individual tributes designed to last for generations to come. As would be expected, every detail of the Pentagon Memorial is deliberate and helps tell a part of the overall story. So right off the bat, we decided to uh, try to figure out a way to invite interpretation, you know, put enough clues, enough hints and clues into this place um, that would make one pause for a second and, and uh, a place to, to, to just contemplate. The act of contemplation at this place is uh, in and of itself a way to pay, pay respect. The memorial consists of 184 individual cantilevered benches perched above a shimmering pool of water, each bearing a single victim's name. 184 unique individuals lost their lives here, um, going about their daily lives. And we wanted to really um, emphasize the, both the individual nature of each of those um, people as well as the collective nature of, of, the, of the event that took place here. The benches themselves are spread across a two acre plot of land and distributed according to the age of the victims across the exact path of American Flight 77 into the point where it struck the western wall of the Pentagon. Each bench is positioned to tell a story of who each person was and how they died. The names of those who died inside the Pentagon can be read with the rebuilt wall itself in the background and those who died on the airplane face the other direction and can be viewed with the backdrop of the sky. The entire park is divided by age lines, representing the birth years of the victims on 9-11. On either end of the memorial, lone benches represent the youngest, Dana Falkenberg, who was only three years old at the time, and on the opposite side, the oldest, John Yamnicki who was 71. The minute you walk over that entrance, you walk over this age line, and it brings you back to, to you know, 
and um, and the first bench you see is Dana Falkenberg, and she's three years old, and you kind of think, oh my gosh, she's a little three-year-old girl, she died on that day, and then there's a few more benches, a few more children, and then there's this big empty area, and then there's, you know, young men, late 20s, early 30s, and um, to me that's hugely powerful. And you walk through there and you, you know, first you see the children and then you go, well, what is with that? And then what are these lines? And it gets people thinking about why are they spaced this way? Oh, this person's 20, this guy's 35. Um, and then they notice the benches are facing a different way. Why is that? And then they can figure that out just by walking through the park. But I, I think the most powerful thing is, is, um, is just entering the park. Stepping over that line, this is 9-11, 2001, 9.37 a.m. Wisdom of the ages tells us that time is the great healer. Perhaps this is one of the mysteries and miracles of life itself, that as the days and months and years roll out, the shock of the tragedy, the intensity of the loss, the unrelenting despair and hopelessness gives way to remembrance, to renewal, and to hope for the future. Within the boundaries of the Pentagon Memorial, we can read the story not merely of a single terrible day in American history, but we are reminded of the great lessons we can see in each story represented there. For as it so often does, from tragedy has arisen a point of triumph, a recognition of the enduring human spirit and the reflections of a nation at large. But for all the wisdom gained through the trials of September 11th, there is something of a question mark at the end of the story, a question that will perhaps never be answered with words, rather with an understanding that the Pentagon Memorial is above all an attempt to make the best of a tragic situation, a quiet understanding that at the heart of the memorial is loss, and that loss is not diminished with time. Perhaps when all is said and done, the best our nation can hope for is that through the lives taken on September 11th and the sacrifices of those who built the Pentagon Memorial, there's a bigger story and a legacy that can impact us all, and that this single day will not be relegated to history. That both the loss and the tremendous spirit to push forward will inspire future generations to think of their lives and their freedom a bit more highly than they did before. It was in that spirit that seven years later, on the morning of September 11, 2008, the world was again drawn together on that plot of ground overlooking our nation's capital, this time to dedicate the Pentagon Memorial. As thousands gathered, and millions across America and around the world watched in solemn remembrance, the new memorial was unveiled. People from all walks of life were there, young and old, rich and poor, government leaders, military leaders, foreign dignitaries, Americans from every social and ethnic group, from big cities and small towns, visitors young and old from all over the world, all united in purpose and spirit. The words spoken were those of remembrance. He was a great brother and a loyal friend. He was a good man. Words 
of reflection. This morning we gather to dedicate this ground where a great building became a battlefield, where stone became dust, steel became shrapnel, where flame, smoke, and destruction stole the lives of 184 men, women, and children. Words of hope and inspiration. The Pentagon Memorial will stand as an everlasting tribute to 184 innocent souls who perished on these grounds. The benches here bear each of their names. And beneath each bench is a shimmering pool filled with the water of life. A memorial can never replace what those of you mourning a loved one have lost. We pray that you will find some comfort amid the peace of these grounds. We pray that you'll find strength in knowing that our nation will always grieve with you. And at the very hour and minute of the tragedy, seven years earlier, there were no words at all. Throughout the crowds that day were the men and women of the Pentagon, the civilian and military personnel who every day are on duty, dedicating themselves to the defense of America. They were there on that day in September 2001. They lived through it, and they were there on this day seven years later. So too in the crowds were the families of those whose lives were sacrificed that day, the husbands and wives, the sons and daughters, the mothers and fathers. For this was really their day, their day to remember, to reflect, and to gain some sense of renewal. Because for the families, the memorial is, above all, an assurance that their loved ones will not be forgotten. It is a place they can go for generations to remember and reflect. And perhaps on some quiet evening, long after the crowds have returned home and when the cameras have been put away, a place they can sit quietly and somehow find a measure of comfort in the presence of those they miss so much. That's what the Pentagon Memorial is all about.